All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our Trenches Technology webinar series. Uh, it's Andrew Farr here, editor with Trenches Technology Magazine, and it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation today on preserving the underground infrastructure at Miami-Dade. Just a few things here before we get started. Uh, during the presentation, you will have the ability to send questions to the presenters through the questions panel, and we encourage attendees to do so. The question panel should be on the right-hand side of your screen with a questions box. Uh, so at the end of the presentation, we will hold a brief Q&A. Um, so without further delay, I will go ahead and introduce our three speakers that we have today. First, we have Daniel McGill, who is the president of Avanti International. Daniel McGill began working at Avanti in 1992 and assumed his current role as president of the company in 2008. Mr. McGill has a bachelor's degree from the University of Houston and a master's from Penn State. We also have Rod Lovett, who is the Chief of Wastewater Collection and Transmission for Miami-Dade Water and Sewer. Rod Lovett has 40 years of underground construction experience and has devoted the last 25 years to the, to the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department and currently serves as the Chief of Wastewater Collection and Transmission Division. Mr. Lovett is also involved in teaching coursework to future generations throughout the state of Florida. And finally, we have Stuart Rome who is the International Development for Cues Incorporated. Stuart Rome has undergraduate degrees in geology, Spanish, and an MBA. Stuart Rome's 20-year career focuses on developing international markets for ultra-pure water purification systems, analytical laboratory equipment, medical devices, and now inspection and rehabilitation of sanitary sewer systems with Cues in Orlando, Florida. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Daniel, who's going to start us off. Great. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I'll start off by asking how many of you have seen a, a sinkhole in your, in your state recently or read an article, perhaps, about how a car has dropped through the street. These are international examples, and, and also here are some local ones, uh, Florida and Houston and Ohio. Um, there are many reasons for sinkholes, including uh, specifically in the southeast United States, karst formations, which is limestone under the ground that dissolves over time and leaves a big cavity. But in many of these examples, sinkholes are, are a result of our failing network of sanitary sewer pipes and storm sewer pipes. If you look at this picture in particular, oftentimes around a sinkhole, you'll, you'll notice some kind of buried infrastructure nearby. And, uh, that might have been the cause of that sinkhole. This is a, a recent example. This is last year in Wisconsin. And you wonder what the, what the story was. But perhaps if you pop the lid off that manhole, you'd see a lot of soil or sand inside, or maybe in those pipes. This is an example in Houston, which is uh, significant to us, because that's where we're headquartered, near Houston. And we've heard for a long time that uh, Houston is not as susceptible to sinkholes and infiltration, because we have clay soils. And, uh, I'm here to tell you, if you've got infiltration in your pipes or your infrastructure, it doesn't matter what the strata is. It's going to bring that infiltration will bring in fines and soil particles over time into the system. So this was about three and a half months ago. It's very recent. It started uh, two feet wide in the morning. And by the end of the day, it was 30 feet wide and 50, 15 feet deep. And it was due to an eight inch sewer pipe. So the question is, where does the soil go? And um, over my portion of the presentation, if there's one thing that you remember, this is the, the slide to remember, the process of sewer failure. If you look at stage one, you can see the infiltration coming into the pipe. And if you were to grout it now through a, a proactive preventative maintenance program, that joint would last for decades. If you don't, you get to stage two, you can see the void outside the pipe is getting larger and you, you begin to see undulation of the pipe of the, of the system itself. Uh, you might still be able to grout it here as well, but if you wait until stage three, there's been no preventative maintenance, um, you, you have failure of the pipe. So now you, you, you can't grout it. You're forced to do an emergency repair, which costs more money. Maybe it's dig and replace or something else, but you can see that the integrity of the pipe is, is gone. Um, not your great-grandfather's clay pipe. If you look at the guy on the left, he's putting a bitumastic material around the joint. 
laying them end to end, and it looks like a shotgun barrel, similar to how they do it today. It looks straight. And clay pipe lasts a long, long time underground, hundreds of years. You can go back to civilizations in Europe and find uh, and clay pipes that were in use that are still there. Um, so it's, it's not a question of is the pipe structurally sound. It comes down to the joint. If you lose your joint, you're going to lose your whole system. Um, because the, the clay we know, for example, will last a long, long time. Just BCP alone, you're looking at 500 million joints alone. Um, and you can see from these images how they were made. They, sometimes they used oakum or, or a bitumastic material, sometimes a, a cement that crumbles over time. But this is the system that we've inherited, the joints we've inherited. So the, the question is, how, how widespread is this problem? And um, I'll pose the question of how many feet of sanitary sewer pipe is there in the US? And the answer is 5 billion feet. And I didn't really understand how, how much 5 billion feet was, so I did a little research. And if we took a trip from the Earth to the Moon, we'd go from the Earth to the Moon to the Earth to the Moon to the Earth. That'd be equal to 5 billion feet, so it, uh, to the Moon and back twice. If we took a trip around the Earth's equator, we would do that 38 times, and that would equal 5 billion feet. That's only sanitary sewer pipe and only in the US. That means there's uh, a lot of joints uh, that are leaking and, and connections. The EPA estimates that there are 23,000 to 75,000 sanitary sewer overflows every year. And I wonder how many of you on the call live in a city that is under consent decree or EPA mandate to deal with your overflows. There are almost 800 cities on the list. So if, once you understand the problem and the scope of it, you have to figure out what type of rehab technology is appropriate for you. There is no silver bullet. Um, really, they're all used. And you'll hear about how Miami-Dade is using a, a combination of technologies. And they may include dig and replace. That's one option. Uh, lining, there's about eight different types of, of lining out there. Um, pipe bursting, if you want to increase the capacity of the pipe. Um, and chemical grouting, if you notice, all of the uh, technologies listed in white here uh, have one thing in common, and that's that they're all structural solutions for a structural problem, whereas chemical grouting is the only technology specifically designed to stop infiltration. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with grouting, and, and some may not, so let's just define it very quickly. It's the injection of a two-component resin into voids outside a pipe or a structure to stop the infiltration stop the exfiltration, stabilize the soil, stabilize the pipe, and seal the annulus between the host pipe and the liner. So you'll hear us talk a whole lot about sealing the entire system. If you seal this joint here, number two, uh, where does the groundwater go? It's going to follow the path of least resistance and come in somewhere else. Maybe it's going to be the lateral connection, or maybe it's going to move up and come in the first joint or two of the lateral, or maybe up around the manhole and come in defects over there. But in order to see reduction of flow at the treatment plant, you've got to address the entire system, not just one aspect of it. Or you'll end up with something like this. If you seal just around the manholes and you don't address the main lines, this is a perfectly good pipe with a leaking joint. And I don't know how many gallons per minute that is, but it's significant, uh, way more than one, one gallon a minute. But if you only had uh, a gallon per minute leak and you had 50 of those, that's over 26 million gallons per year going to the treatment plant. That's uh, we're unnecessarily spending money to treat that water. So this is how they'll take care of it. They put a, a packer in the, in the pipe. The camera there, let's say it's an 8-inch pipe, can see the leak. Um, if it wasn't actively leaking, the operator can do an air test and test the integrity of that joint. If it leaks air, then they grout it. And you'll notice that the grout doesn't just seal the joint. It seals, it goes into the soil outside the pipe and prevents both infiltration and exfiltration. They do an air test to confirm that it has indeed sealed the joint, and then they go on to the next one. And the cure time may be 20 to 30 seconds. This is a, a, what they call a grout donut 25 years later after they, they dug this pipe up. Uh, in this particular scenario, they uh, put a liner in because of the defects here, which was fine until they went and cut a hole in that perfectly good liner, and the water traveling in the annular space between host pipe and liner comes right back into the system, so they won't see a reduction in flows at the treatment plant unless they grout that lateral connection. The grout goes in the annulus between the host pipe and liner and out the defect into the soil. And again, there's an air test. 
when you get to sealing manholes, there's about five different techniques you can use. Um, and they include, this, this is the oakum technique, it's a rope-like material. They'll dunk it in resin and stuff it into that joint as long as the joint is wet. And it stops the water coming in. Another technique is they can use the same chemical that they use for sealing main lines. They drill a hole through the structure, pump the grout into the soil outside, and now water can't get to that structure anymore. So really we're talking about preventative maintenance versus emergency repair like this, uh, which is uh, much more expensive. And once the entire system is sealed, this is what it would look like. The, the manhole's been taken care of, the main line's been addressed, the lateral, and a few feet up the lateral connection. Um, Rod, I'll pass it over to you to talk more about what uh, Miami's doing specifically. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Dan. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the I, I guess, the uh, southernmost largest uh, water and sewer utility in the country. Uh, just a few facts about the utility. To short facts, we we have about 6,200 miles of pipe, a little more than that. Uh, over 80,000 miles of 80,000 manholes, uh, over 1,000 pump stations. Uh, we'll, I'll tell you why a little later. We have so many pump stations. We serve about 342,000 retail customers and 13 municipal wholesale customers. A municipal wholesale customer is uh, a municipality which chooses to maintain their own collection system while we uh, provide the downstream transmission treatment and disposal services. Over the past years, we've had about a 28% increase in customer base of, over the past 17 years. Uh, in Miami-Dade County, we have unique conditions, conditions that may not be prevalent in other parts of the country. Uh, we have a very low topography. We have uh, little or no topography change in in the uh, in the county which requires us to lay very short shallow collection systems and have a lot of pump stations uh, our, our water table is typically typically about four feet from the top of the ground and our geological structure is what is called uh, Miami oolite or oolitic limestone which is extremely porous material and the water just runs through it like much like a sponge, and uh, and we so if we dig a trench, the water comes straight to that trench, and infiltration is a great deal more prevalent, as in maybe clay strata. Our INF program utilizes the dig and replace um, uh, as a repair method. It's uh, it's 80 percent. Says 80 percent of this collection system is underwater. We have to have unique uh, conditions for for INI rehab and INI inspection. We also do uh, CIP liners, or cured in place liners. We used to do fold and form liners. Uh, the, due to the fact that fold and form liners have pretty much maintained their their prices and CIP liners have been reduced and greatly reduced in price. Uh, we prefer CIP liners uh, mostly because we have a, a smaller annular space in the CIP liners. They fit tight, more tightly against the host pipe. We also do sectional liners. So a sectional liner is a short CIP liner, belt resin bag uh, that is installed for a spot repair or point repair. We've done a little, very little, but uh, a small amount of pipe bursting. And th the reason with it, the pipe bursting has not been prevalent in Miami-Dade County is, is because of the cost of pipe bursting. A pipe bursting may be competitive for gravity lines with little or no connections. The prices remain high because of our housing density in small lots of sometimes 100 feet or less. The more houses, the more lateral connections, the more excavations required for the pipe bursting, and therefore the higher prices for pipe bursting. We continue to rely on chemical grout as a major means of reducing leaks in the system. Chemical grout, while not considered a structural repair, 
is an inexpensive way of stopping leaks in the collection system. Our repair evaluation process takes in three considerations. We, we make repair calls based on, first of all, structural. Does the repair meet load requirements for the repair, for the soil loading and, and the external hydraulic loading? Also, is the repair feasible? Can it be done simply? Uh, and the last one, and maybe most important one, is is it cost effective? Does it meet the first two criteria, and is it the least expensive repair application? As in any program, it is important to document your success and your benefits, and in the INI program, our INI program is no exception to this. Uh, we have documented to date over 100, almost 128 million gallons per day of uh, infiltration and inflow correction over the last 17, 18, 18 years of the program. What does this mean? It means that there is a significant cost savings, or our accountants would prefer to call it cost avoidance. Uh, the, the calculated cost of savings uh, and the cost against the cost of building a 128 MGD plant uh, is is about one to two and a half dollars. In other in other words, ever for every one dollar we spend on I and I, we avoid spending two and a half dollars for capital expense in in plant building or expansion. We spent to date about $400 million on I&I and 128 MGD treatment plant, including transmission treatment and disposal systems, would cost us well over a billion dollars. Grout repairs enable us to hold the line on I&I repair costs. A typical grout repair is used typically less than $2,500 per line segment, while CIP repairs are eight to ten thousand dollars. A dig and replace repair may be as as high as twenty-two thousand dollars, and other repairs are equally expensive. There are sometimes that grout repairs will not do the job, but when it does do the job, the grout saves us a lot of money. This is a graph showing our success in the in the uh, INI program. The red line depicts the increase in system inventory or customer base over the 17-year period. The blue line shows actual metered flows to the treatment plants. As you can see, the flows continue to drop since we started the INI program, and the difference is almost 128 MGDs. Many of you read in the paper about our upcoming uh, consent order that uh, is, if we've just agreed to, the commission has approved 4.245 billion, that's right, with a B, and, uh, of uh, bond uh, sales to make repairs on mostly plants and transmission systems. However, there will be an INI element that will also be required. You might ask why? Or why are we now under a consent order? Well, that's a more than one part question. First of all, we're the big kids on the block, the largest utility in the state of Florida, and regulators tend to pick on us a little bit. I see we got two percent regulators out there, so I'm, I hope you're listening. But the number of SSOs per hundred miles of pipe in Miami-Dade County is relatively low compared to other utilities in Florida. However, when we do have an overflow, they're typically larger because we we have larger pipes. That coupled with our very sensitive ecosystem, as well as it, we don't have a confining layer between our drinking water source and the top of the ground, makes it very important that we reduce spills more than others. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Stuart Rome with Cues Incorporated. He's going to tell you things, some things about grout applications. 
Thank you, Rod. Predictable outcomes. Uh, municipalities and other enterprises, they understand the rationale and the benefit to monitoring the value and the condition of their assets. And uh, to have a process to manage those values leads to reproducible results so they can effectively manage their manpower, their equipment, and their budgets, and also so they can appropriately allocate those resources. Municipalities manage their assets as good business practice, of course, but also as uh, accountability to their rate payers. And to manage those assets, they need to know a few things, one of which is what's buried in the ground. That type of information is available if you have your assets in GIS or in your as-built drawings. Uh, probably the key aspect is what condition are your assets in. And to find out about that, it's a combination of CCTV and inspection concurrent with condition assessment. And part of that assessment will include scoring or weighting of defects, whether they're an O&M defect or a structural defect. And you can use that through PACP coding, through your default scoring, or uh, weighting in your condition assessment software, or with custom scoring, as some municipalities do, based on their particular needs. After you do the assessment, you're able to prioritize your actions, determine, well, what's the likelihood that an asset's going to fail, and what is the consequence if it does fail? Once you're able to answer all those questions, you determine what's the method of repair. Do we clean? Do we rehabilitate? Or do we replace? So the key step here is proactive condition assessment, because that's your first line of defense against sanitary sewer overflows, pipe failures, sinkholes, uh, EPA consent decrees or mandates, and avoiding excessive cost. If you're being proactive, a repair will not turn into a replacement. So process equals predictable outcomes. Uh, this is a general flow of the process, cleaning, inspecting, assessing, prioritizing, and rehabilitating, whether you're grouting, relining, or replacing. And this is a continuous process. For the grouting process, one of the key aspects is to systematically test, seal, and validate the joints. Now, CCTV will prove out effective in visual when you have visual infiltration. But not seeing infiltration doesn't necessarily mean there hasn't been infiltration, there isn't infiltration, or there won't be infiltration. And that's why you need a systematic process by which you test, seal if required, and validate the seal joint. And we're going to look at a couple of animations here uh, to give you more of a perspective. This is an animation of mainline sewer grouting. Here you have the camera on a skid and the uh, and the packer being pulled, you already determined that if there's a problem with the, with the infiltration, you're injecting the grout, checking your pressures in, in there to make sure that it's full, and injecting again, validating that the repair is good, and moving on to the next one. When you're doing laterals, especially on a lined pipe, that's a little different animal as uh, as shown previously. Here you're lining a pipe. Uh, that infiltration will follow the annular space and end up back in the line. So you need a solution to be able to get rid of the infiltration in the lateral. Here you have a special packer that's designed for laterals. And you move it up into place. You will extend the bladder up into the lateral, and then begin to inject the grout, which will take care of the infiltration that's going into the annular space, uh, grout the joint entering the main line, and one or subsequent joints up the lateral. To some, grouting is more uh, an art than a science, and there's a bit of mystery to it. It can be intimidating, maybe not seen very user-friendly, uh, kind of a 1940s submarine control room type situation. And uh, with that 
perhaps intimidation, all the bells and bulbs and dials. You may have issues with accuracy, with repeatability, with consistency between operators, uniformity between operators, and even retention of the steps and procedures when you don't grout all year round. And now coming on the market, in the market, are control rooms that have a newer configuration that usually utilize a digital interface that will allow you to get the repeatability, the consistency uh, between operators, and the accuracy. For example, you don't need to remember what the packer pressure needs to be, what the test pressure needs to be. By inputting the pipe size, you get the packer pressure. The pipe depth, you get the recommended air test pressure. The gel time, you've determined ahead of time. And the pass time for pass fail on a joint, which the ASTM standard is, one PSI drop in 15 seconds. So to start the test, you'll see it graphically, uh, although not in an animation form here. You'd hit the air test and the timer. You'd see the pressure go up. And between this red line and this green line is 15 seconds. The system in the background is calculating any pressure drop. If at any time during that 15-second uh, period it drops one PSI, you'd get a red light saying fail, and it would appear up here as well. In that case, you'd hit the pump. Auto timer would auto automatically be on. You'd start injecting grout. You'd watch the pressure here, which between these two lines, which is your gel time. If the pressure stabilizes or starts to go down gradually, you've probably routed it well. If it drops off steeply, you hit the pump again to start the grouting process again. So it takes a lot of the, the guesswork and the, and the memory required uh, in some of the older systems. Uh, this is a picture of a one gallon per minute leak in an eight inch clay pipe. This is your packer. Here's a picture with the eight inch packer inflated. And they're either testing the joint or injecting grout at this point. And this is post grouting. You can see that the infiltration is gone. And in this particular case, the uh, operator used dye in the grouting so they can get a better visual view of, uh, of the grouting process. All right, Stuart, we have a quick question for you here. What is the capability of CCTV to identify all defects? Well, one of the great benefits of CCTV inspection is that you can see uh, if the pipe is properly cleaned, of course, uh, you know, 95 percent uh, of, of all the defects in the line. Now, what you're not going to see is if you have a defective joint. And that's why testing, sealing, and validating the joints will give you the peace of mind and the knowledge that indeed you've uh, attacked that particular uh, defect in your line that wouldn't be available or visible due to the CCTV inspection. Okay, and uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick poll question right now. All right, uh, so then at this time, I think we'll go ahead and turn it back over to Daniel. Great. Okay, thanks. I'll just spend a couple of minutes hey, talking about grout chemistry. There are several different types of grouts out there, including cement, silicates, bentonite, ultrafine cement. Those are largely for geotechnical applications. In the municipal uh, market, there's typically just the acrylics and the urethanes. Acrylics break down to acrylamide grout, NMA grouts, and acrylates, and the urethanes are either gels and foams, and they cure flexibly or rigidly. And we'll take a couple minutes to see where are grouts used, because um, it's interesting to know that it's not just uh, this simple sewer chemical. These, are, these same grouts uh, acrylic grouts are used all over the world to control groundwater in a variety of applications, and I'll just touch on some significant ones. Um, in the 1950s is when acrylic grout started being used in the United States, and it was just for soil stabilization. It wasn't until the 1960s they began using it in uh, main lines, laterals, and manholes. And then in 1985, the U.S. Department of Energy did um, a 20-year study. They studied seven different types of grouts to determine what they wanted to use to encapsulate radioactive waste. And after that 20-year period, um, they used uh, acrylamide grout because they gave it a 362-year half-life in the soil. So it lasts a long time. 
if you set it out in the parking lot of your office, it won't last a single day because it wants to be underground in a moist environment. Even our clients in Egypt, a very arid uh, environment, the grout does just fine because there's enough humidity under the ground to keep it happy. So they uh, encapsulated 9.5 million gallons of radioactive waste uh, for the long term. Um, mines and tailings dams, I, I got to go uh, into a mine in Canada. We were 1,500 feet underground. And they used the same chemical that's used in mainline sewers, which was a surprise to me because it was holding back tremendous head pressure, seven or 800 PSI. I didn't know that it could do that. But because the grout is, uh, has no suspended solids, it can go anywhere water goes. So it goes into all these super fine cracks and cures and creates its own mechanical lock and stops the groundwater from coming in. They're used in concrete and earthen dams, underwater applications. Uh, any underground structure, it doesn't matter whether it's a manhole, a lift station, or a wet well, you can uh, stop water leaks um, without excavation by using these grouts. You can inject the grouts in front of uh, TBMs to uh, not only stop water, but um, stabilize the soil, consolidate it so that it gives the, the machine something to bite into as it moves forward. And pre-excavation grouting, this is arguably the largest chemical grout project in the US. Um, the city of Dearborn was under EPA mandate to deal with their overflows. And their solution was to put in underground storage tanks. And these are massive tanks, 120 feet wide, 150 feet deep. The walls of the tank are seven feet thick concrete. But when they drilled into the ground beforehand to do their geologic testing, water shot up into the air 20 feet because of artesian pressures. So they knew they had to deal with the water. Um, and they put in a grout curtain so that they could excavate and begin construction before uh, they dealt with the water before construction. Uh, one of our largest customers is a, a, a Toronto Transit Commission. They just drill holes through the subway, pump the grout into the soil on the backside, and then water can't even get to the structure anymore. Same technique uh, at, they use in manholes. All of that's significant is because that's why acrylics are largely used in the municipal market. They're the thinnest products on the market. There's no suspended solids, field adjustable cure times and gel strengths, uh, soap and water cleanup, not activated by moisture, which is important, and there's no need for solvents. Um, and then obviously a, a successful track record over the last 60 years. If you see uh, the image on the right, that's a betta fish. And um, we poured acrylamide grout into the sand, and it cured. So that's grout in the sand, and then dry sand on the bottom here. Um, just an interesting visual for you to show that the, the fish is alive and well, and uh, the sand is dry. He's been living in there. Uh, he's in our office here for about uh, three years. Um, so that, that gives you a little bit of uh, grout chemistry. Uh, Rod, I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Over 20 years ago, we began sitting around a table trying to figure out how long grout would last. Uh, and we calculated that if we had to regrout every five years, grout would be cost effective. 20 years later, we've looked back at what we grouted 20 years ago, and, then we, and it's still holding. We still have good, good grout repairs. We had no idea at the time that grout would actually last that long. Things that we do, we key on in terms of grouting are manhole leaks and annular space leaks as well as uh, uh, joint leaks. So, the annular space leaks are where the water travels through the cracks in the hose pipe. And I would think that was demonstrated earlier. Uh, and through the lateral reinstatement of the CIP liner, or curtain place liner. We are operating about nine trucks today capable of performing both TV inspection and grout repairs. Miami Water and Sewer Department prefers to perform all grouting in-house. The construction management cost is a large percentage of the construction cost. This is due to the fact that if you're going to properly oversee a contractor, you need to have an inspector typically in a, in a grout truck looking over one guy's shoulder to make sure he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Uh, so that, uh, that expense of having that one guy in that truck with another guy, a contractor, it tends to be very high. There's also issues with ensuring contractors are performing their work correctly. 
our experience with grout contractors is, is frankly that if they don't do the, stop the leaks, you still have to pay them. Is grout an art or a science? Well, I think it's both. In our case, it is, anyhow. Uh, now, while new technology continues to be developed, our operators require both training and experience to master the art of grouting. This time I'll turn it over to Stuart again. It was, uh, grouting was the first trenchless technology, and we've come a long way. Um, along those lines is coming up with some specifications for professionals, for engineers, for contractors, for users. And NASCO and ICGA, which is Infiltration Control Grout Association, in conjunction with industry professionals and experts, have uh, come up with specs. And they lay out the requirements, the products, and the execution for grouting main lines and laterals. And this is uh, one of the promised documents you'll get uh, after the webinar. As far as an impact for public works, uh, lowered cost of pumping and treatment because of less water and less stress on pumping stations and treatment plant and the sheer uh, reduction in volume. And this is important, justifiable and defensible spending for O&M and capital works both internally to an organization and externally to the ratepayers. For communities, your tax dollars are used more wisely in the eyes of the ratepayers. In some cases, sewer rates have gone down rather than gone up because of the I and I programs put in place by certain municipalities using grouting as one of the technologies. And then of course, fewer disruptions to home, business, and traffic. So these are all qualitative things. Let's look at an actual case history. This is for the city of Sunrise, Florida. So population 86,000, not a major metro. And they had a problem uh, before grouting a 12-inch pipeline, a 500-foot segment. The pumps downstream are pumping 720,000 gallons per day. After grouting, the pumps were pumping 105,000 gallons a day. So saving 615,000 gallons a day for grouting, uh, after grouting. Now they grouted every joint all 100 joints on that 500 feet, and used about $4,000 worth of chemicals. The savings just on the reduction in wastewater totaled about $485,000. So if you look at the payback just on routing materials, it was three days. But also we need to look at the capital cost of investing in the TV grout truck. Uh, based on this particular example, one 500-foot segment of pipe, uh, your payback in this particular case would be less than one year. So this is a real-world world example uh, of, of how grouting can save money both on the O&M side and on the capital side. So people do process gets things done. Uh, Rod has shown very, very well their INI program that combines the equipment, the people, and the, process, uh, the chemical grout all combined into an INI program, which saves uh, millions of gallons of water per day to the treatment plant. All right. Well, uh, at this point, we'll go into the Q and A. Um, we'll just got some good questions coming in, so we'll just jump right into these. Uh, Rod, this one is directed towards you, and I'm not sure exactly what this was referring to, maybe the grouting. Uh, some, this person asked, does the existing system need to be out of service for this to be done? Well, typically when we have large flows, we'll plug the extreme, and, and the uh, collection system is typically large enough to um, uh, hold until we, we finish uh, the grouting or and or an inspection of the particular line segment. Uh, so it's not necessary, it's not usually necessary to put in a bypass in order to to do work, uh, grout work on a line segment. 
Okay. And then, Stuart, this one is for you. Um, this person asked, isn't CCTV a bit more viable when the water table is four feet below the surface? Well, I think uh, Rod could probably answer that question uh, better than I. Um, uh, if there's no infiltration, then the water table won't, won't affect uh, the ability to do CCTV inspection. Well, the water table uh, does not affect that unless we have massive leaks that we can't control. Uh, in some cases, we've had to plug uh, upstream and downstream in order, in order to tee the, the line underwater if there's too much infiltration coming in. I'm not sure if that's what the question we're being asked, uh, but uh, uh, we've gotten to the point where we don't have major leaks like that anymore, and we have more or less minor, you know, one to five gallons. Sometimes, a, sometimes you'll see a ten-gallon leak, but we can we can typically uh, get through there and do an inspection and or grouting uh, in those kind of conditions. If the reference is to flow in the line uh, that that can't be bypassed or plugged. Uh, there are options uh, such as uh, sonar and uh, TV, CCTV combined with sonar that allow you to float down the line so you do TV above and sonar below. So that is an option if you can't either plug or divert the line and there's considerable flow in the line. Okay, and then uh, just moving along, this one is directed towards you, Daniel. When the grout is pumped out, uh, as you showed on a lateral in the presentation, does it end up leaving a layer of grout along the inside of the pipe, which then would decrease the pipe diameter? The, there is a small layer of gel, a thin layer of gel that's left inside the pipe. And um, it's, it's basically insignificant, because eventually that, that thin layer of gel will just dry up and fall off and get it go to the treatment plant. So what's, what's important is how much grout was pumped outside the pipe. And the new NASCO spec uh, helps contractors and municipalities figure out what the cure time needs to be to ensure that the grout gets outside the pipe. So um, you will see a little bit of gel there, um, but it doesn't, doesn't decrease the capacity of the pipe. It won't stay there long. Okay, and then another question for you. What can be done?